Uh, I am absolutely delighted to have as our guest this evening the one and only Corey Bernardi, who joins us from Adelaide. How are you, Corey? Rowan, I'm particularly pleased to be joining you and uh, congratulations on your new show, or is no. that a bit premature? <laughs> my one <laughs> night, my two nights, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Corey. Now, uh, Corey, you're the Senator for South Australia, obviously. Um, what I wanted to, well, wanted to talk about a number of things, but one thing that particularly struck me, uh, over Easter we had, uh, in Lahore, we had Islamic terrorists specifically targeting Christians at an Easter parade, trying mm. to cause maximum death and mayhem. Around the world, we're seeing Christians being persecuted, yet on many fronts, the world is silent. There are churches in Australia that are more concerned with offering sanctuary uh, to failed asylum seekers, in other words, economic refugees, than concerned about speaking about the persecution of Christians. What are your thoughts on this? Well, Rowan, you're absolutely right, and one Vatican observer has said this is the greatest story never told of the 21st century. I mean, we've got 80% uh, or thereabouts of religious um, uh, violence or, uh, or persecution happens to Christians, and in 9 out of 10 of the countries where they're susceptible and vulnerable to it, the most egregious offenders are where the, you know, the state-sponsored religion, if you will, is Islam. Now that's something the media doesn't want to talk about. It's something that is an inconvenient truth for so many out there who say, you know, uh, you know all these minorities are being picked on. The reality is the most persecuted people on earth are Christians. And that's pretty scary. And what, one thing that is particularly noticeable is how reluctant, as you say, the West is to confront this. One of the reasons frequently given is that we don't want to inflame a kind of Christian Muslim war. But tell that to yeah. the people who are losing their homes, being killed. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, nuns handcuffed and shot in the head. We've had uh, Christian women in Nigeria who have their legs bound as they're giving birth. Uh, the most horrific abuses are occurring and yet the West still thinks, oh, no, no, we better not talk about it. What steps can Christians, but more importantly, Christian nations, uh, Western nations, take to speak up? Well, I think it's incumbent upon all uh, politicians and all members of any, you know, uh, dignified and, um, I think, uh, uh, civilized nation to talk about injustice and one of the greatest injustices we see is where there's no freedom of religion nine out of ten of the most egregious offenders against uh, Christians are in um, nations where their major religion is Islam the exception to that is North Korea which is a communist uh, dictatorship a totalitarian state We've got all sorts of circumstances happening where people, say in Iran, for example, where we're now starting to normalise relations with, people who are Christian pastors uh, are imprisoned and face the death sentence. Now, I've put in any number of uh, motions through the Senate trying to ask the Iranians to reconsider some of this. Uh, some of those motions haven't been advanced because of votes of the opposition or the Greens. Now, I find that extraordinary, but I also find it extraordinary that we're trying to normalise you know, our relations with countries such as Iran, where these things are happening, where they're hanging people just because they're homosexual, or they're killing people because they happen to subscribe to a different faith. Those things are an anathema to us. We've got to call them out. And, uh, you know, I just reckon it's incumbent upon every government all around the world to say freedom of religion, freedom of worship, freedom of thought, and freedom of speech are the most important things that we can have for a free nation. Absolutely. I'll come back to Iran in a second, but I was... Uh, before Malcolm Turnbull became Prime Minister, we had briefly uh, Tony Abbott and Scott Morrison talking about these 12,000 Syrian refugees, that they would be from persecuted minorities. That idea kind of drifted away, then came back again. I'm not quite sure where we stand at the moment on that. But surely one thing Australia could do is say, we are only going to take persecuted Christians, Yazidis, from this conflict to show the world, to highlight that they are the ones ones who are the most persecuted in that region by that, by ISIS and others. Rowan, you're right, and the intention behind the additional refugee intake from the Syrian conflict was to take in persecuted minorities. Now, they're not exclusively Christian. There are minority uh, religions there that are also equally persecuted. 
But, you know, shortly after it was announced, I asked the government to reconsider us taking that refugee intake because most of the people that are going to be taken in come from the United Nations camps. And I know, based on my involvement with uh, organisations that support persecuted Christians around the world, I know that most of the people in those camps are not persecuted Christians because they don't feel and safe there. And you now, know we why have an that extraordinary is extraordinary circumstance. Exactly. Because you know they go there, they go there, and they get beaten up, and they get killed, and they get threatened because they're Christians exactly. by the Muslims that are there at the United Nations refugee camps. And there's a worker in Iraq who's come forward and said the Christians aren't going to the United Nations camps because they are so scared that they will meet their end there. I mean, that's an extraordinary worrying uh, thing, particularly at a time when we are so, you know, supposedly cozying up to the United Nations on so many other fronts. But back to Iran, uh, it disturbs me that on the one hand we're playing footsies with the Iranians and, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're our new mates and they're over here and, and, and all the rest of it. On the other hand, thanks to Obama's uh, bizarre uh, agreement, they're busy building nuclear weapons and on the side of their bombs and weapons, they specifically write what they intend to do with their bombs and weapons, which is wipe Israel off the map. They write it on their missiles, they've said that they, death to America, death to Israel, they're not interested in any side of the agreement other than the fact that they're going to get nuclear weapons. What on earth is going on and why are we supporting this? Uh, Rowan, I, I smiled inadvertently when you were talking about that, and it's not because it's a flippant cause, but it beggars belief. It, it's almost, if it wasn't so serious and wasn't so uh, true, it would be a joke. I mean, we've got the world's leading nation, the United States, uh, trying to normalise relations with Iran, and, and, you know, we're trying to do our bit to go along with that as well. And the Iranians, as you say, are committed to a nuclear cycle, they're committed to nuclear weapons no matter what they say. They've got the green light for this. The sanctions have been lifted. There's billions of dollars flowing into their economy from America. And on the side of the bombs they've got, we're going to wipe out Israel. Now, I just find that extraordinary. It's not a recipe for peace in the Middle East. Uh, it's a recipe for disaster. So and does, does I just think we've got to wake up to it. Exactly. And does anyone point out to them that maybe they might fla in, be inflaming uh, <laughs> relationships? But anyway, a uh, couple of things I want to touch on as well, Cora. It's great to have you here. This uh, story about the Catholic club that won't uh, is being deregistered. I think it's at Sydney Uni because uh, they want only Catholics in the Catholic club. Uh, can you believe yeah. this story? <laughs> no, it, it, look, it's extraordinary. I mean, political correctness has gone completely mad all around the world, but particularly in Australia. We've got clubs on campus where, you know, religious clubs, where they have to admit people who are not of their own religion. I mean, you go, what's the point of it? <laughs> you know, will we, will we be forced to admit more, more Marxists to the Liberal Party? Or, you know, will the Labor Party be forced to accept, you know, some more people like Joe Bullock, uh, sensible people that would, you know, risk dragging them back to the middle ground? You know, this is an extraordinary circumstance. And universities are extraordinarily intolerant of any number of things except when it comes to some sort of lefty agenda. You can invite some, some uh, you know, Palestinian anti-Israel, uh, hater of Jews, anti-Semite onto your campus and they can give a speech. You can invite the Islamic uh, militants onto your campus and separate men and women in your, camp, in your hall and that's okay, but you can't run a Catholic club for Catholics. <laughs> for Catholics it strikes me as stupid. We need a safe space for Christians on campus. That's what I think we need. You are um, absolutely and, right. Uh, it, it, there's, a, there's a madness that's pervading this and not enough people are calling it out. I mean, you do, Rowan, and a number of other commentators do, but so many others are making excuses for it. And that's what I think is making Australia wake up and go, what on earth is going on here? When are we going to see some common sense re-injected into our political system? And when are people going to call out this idiocy for what it is? And thank God, Corey, there are people like you, you predominantly, who aren't afraid to call it out, even though uh, Bill Shorten will call you a homophobe or whatever else he feels like at the moment. Uh, we, but the good news is that the women's, with an asterisk instead of an E, so it's w woman's or something, review society 
society, they are allowed to have exclusively female identifying students, whatever they are. So there you go. So all is not lost, Corey. Um, just very quickly, um, you once referred to Larissa Waters as overdoing it on the eggnog uh, with her uh, concern about what toys our kids play with. They're now talking about plain packaging for toys. I couldn't believe this one. So that you don't know what the toy is because you don't want it to be identified as a masculine or a feminine toy because that apparently leads to domestic violence. Can you fill me in on this because somewhere in there I get lost. Well a couple of years ago it was Christmas time and Larissa Waters and her green comrades said you know you shouldn't be giving uh, toys packaged in blue for boys and pink for girls. She neglected to mention she dresses her daughter in a pink skirt but that's uh, by the by. Now they've got a Senate inquiry into the fact that uh, gender you know specific toys somehow contributes to uh, the male paradigm and dominance and it's going to contribute to domestic violence in the future. If only we knew that the big, the scourge of domestic violence was because boys choose to play with trucks and girls like to play with dolls. Um, Extraordinary. You know, I, don't know, I, I don't know how we've survived so many generations. <laughs> Corey Bernardi, thank you so much. A real pleasure to talk to you and keep up fighting the good fight. Thank you, Corey. Thanks, Rob. And. Uh, uh, terrific senator. We're very lucky to have Corey in our parliament, let me tell you that.